Another issue that the author of the book of the prophet Daniel deals with is the whole issue of the history of Israel from the Babylonian captivity up to the persecution of Antiochus that led to the Maccabean revolt. Working on the concentric structure of the Aramaic chapters in which the central chapters deal with God making and breaking kings, the two chapters before and after deal with God saving from death in the fiery furnace and the lion's den, chapters 2 and 7, the first and last chapters of these Aramaic sections of the book of Daniel, deal with God as master over history. In chapter 2, we have the vision of the statue, which Nebuchadnezzar has at night, and he consults Daniel for the interpretation. In chapter 7, Daniel has an apocalyptic vision of four beasts emerging from the sea. These two correspond with each other in driving home the message that God is master of history, and both of them speak of the historical progress from the Babylonian captivity up to the persecution of the Seleucid Empire under King Antiochus. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has the dream of the statue with a head of gold, a chest of silver, a torso of bronze, legs of iron, and feet made of iron mixed with clay. Now many fundamentalist Christians have various interpretations of that statue but one has to look at it from the historical perspective and the theology of history that the author of Daniel is trying to convey in speaking to his people of that time. In his vision, the conclusion is of a great stone that is not mined, unlike gold, silver, bronze, and iron and clay, a stone that is not mined or refined by human hands, crashes against the feet of the great statue, crumbling the entire statue. And then that stone is built up to be a great mountain that covers the entire earth. It is at this point in the vision that the author of Daniel now projects into the future. He's caught up to his own time in describing the statue and the empires they represent. But now he projects to offer hope for the future that was not necessarily historically fulfilled, but is nonetheless a prophecy and a projection that God will intervene for his people to save them from their persecution and set up a kingdom that will dominate the entire earth. As Christians, we recognize that as fulfilled in Jesus and the salvation he won for us by his death on the cross and the ministry of Christianity throughout the world. As Daniel interprets the dream, he says that you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. The silver a chest is a kingdom that will come after him, which has a great splendor, but not the splendor of Nebuchadnezzar, which would represent the Babylonian and Median kingdoms after Nebuchadnezzar dies. The torso of bronze represents the Persian Empire. The legs of iron represent the Greek Empire, the conquest of Alexander the Great, and the feet of iron and tile are those post-Alexandrian kingdoms which didn't have the strength of Alexander but were nonetheless dominant in the region and intermingled through marriage and of course some of their power was weakened by these alliances and intrigues and corruption. Daniel doesn't name these empires but he speaks of kingdoms that will come one upon the other. And this vision is a very heavily veiled vision in which Daniel is now pulling back some of that veil to reveal what the vision of the statue represents. Corresponding to that, we have the vision of the four beasts in chapter 7, in which Daniel himself, from Babylon, has a vision of the future of his people in the vision of the four beasts, a lion with wings, a bear with tusks, followed by a leopard with four heads and four wings, followed by a great beast of iron that is so terrible it's very vaguely described but has multiple horns on it. Eventually those horns would be shattered and a single horn that speaks arrogantly would emerge to suppress and persecute God's people. Here again, while not naming those empires, knowing the history from the Babylonian captivity until the Maccabean revolt and the persecution of Antiochus, we see in the lion the kingdom of 
Nebuchadnezzar. We see in the bear with tusks, the kingdom of the Medes and the Babylonians after the death of, of Nebuchadnezzar. We see in the leopard, a symbol of the Persian Empire, which would eventually conquer Babylon and dominate the Jewish people after allowing them to return home to their, uh, to their, their land, their worship, and their temple once it is rebuilt. And then the great iron beast which conquers everybody would be the great iron kingdom of Greece under Alexander the Great. And the horns representing those kingdoms that sprung up after Alexander's death, of which one horn grew to push aside the other horns that had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. And who is that arrogant king? That arrogant king is Antiochus, who would presume to enculturate God's holy people into a pagan society with pagan worship, demanding that he himself be worshipped as connected to the divine. He suppresses the worship of the Jewish people, punishing them if they engage in the Jewish observances of their faith. And in this, Daniel is describing the progression of history from the Babylonian captivity up to the persecution of Antiochus. Then, at this point, he projects into the future in a vision that isn't necessarily fulfilled from the standpoint of Daniel's prophecy, but nonetheless emphasizes the, author, the author's message that he wants to drive home, that God will intervene. And what is the conclusion of this vision? One like a son of man came forth and overthrew these kingdoms. Now, of course, as Christians, we recognize that as fulfilled in Jesus and the spread of Christianity. The author of Daniel, however, is giving us something very different from these grotesque beasts. Not a lion with wings, a bear with tusks, a leopard with four heads and four wings, and a grotesque iron monster, but rather the image of something made in God's image and likeness. A human being made in God's image and likeness will emerge forth with the power of God to overthrow these kingdoms and liberate his people. This may not have come about historically exactly as the author describes in this vision, but nonetheless he drives home the point in both the vision of the statue and the vision of the four beasts that God is the master of history. All that has transpired has done so according to God's plan, and then it is by the power of God that this horrendous persecution under this arrogant king who sprang forth from all these different kingdoms will be overthrown. And it is by the power of God that his holy people will be liberated, the kingdom of Israel will be restored, and the proper worship of the God of Israel will be brought about once again for his holy people. Well, if the basic message of the story of Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the statue and Daniel's vision of the four beasts is that God is master of history, then we apply it to our everyday lives today by recognizing God is master of history and that is not limited to the history of Israel. We can see that as applied to the history of the church and the leadership and events of the church's history, that God ultimately is guiding the church through history as Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would. That too can be said for us here in the United States, from which I am giving this video, and for those in nations throughout the world. It can be a challenging point of our faith, but nonetheless, we call it a theology of history, in which looking back on our history, we recognize those parts when God is touching our lives, is touching our nation, is touching our church, as he is master of history, and God is the guide of all nations, recognized by looking back through a theology in which we recognize God's mastery of history.